Uh, so thank you all for coming to this talk about uh, versioning and reproducibility in machine learning experiments. We're going to present uh, the work we have been doing with our open source package, which is called Abelve Tools. It's short for Machine Learning Versioning Tools. Uh, I hope you can read the slides because the contrast is quite bad, <laughs> actually. Sorry about that. So hi, I'm Sarah. I've been uh, working in data science for uh, a few years now. Uh, I'm usually doing talks about things like um, ethics, uh, fairness in machine learning, data privacy, that kind of things. But I'm also interested in all this like data ops culture. Uh, so promise there won't be too much buzzword in this presentation, but it's just like, uh, I think that data scientists should be able to bring their uh, own models to production and really own the whole process from uh, building the model all the way to production. Yeah, and I, uh, I'm Stephanie. I've been a software developer for six years, and uh, I have a strong interest in uh, automation and code quality. And uh, we are both working uh, at PeopleDoc, uh, Biotech Software Company. So first, the obligatory disclaimer, all the stories, all the characters, all the projects which is presented in this uh, talk are purely fictional. Any similarities with something uh, in reality is entirely uh, coincidental, so really like something you've probably never seen ever before. So it's morning down morning, uh, quite early, you just grab your cup of coffee, and uh, you're really happy data scientists because on Friday night you finally came to a breakthrough on this really hard project you've been working on. And, uh, and you get this like beautiful results. Yeah, so you're like, great, <laughs> great confusion matrix. You send it to your boss, you say, oh, that's great. Let's put it into production. So you say, okay, okay, yeah, let's do that. Uh, Monday morning, 10 a.m., you've just met your uh, co-worker. She's a software engineer. You're really lucky to be working in an interdisciplinary team, so you're going to be able to, to put this in production real quick. So you show her uh, your code, which is like something like that. A lot of notebooks. You've extracted a bit of Python on the top for helper function, and now you're not sure if your co-worker is going to faint or if she's going to stab you in the eye, but you're like, very bravely choosing a, a strategical retreat, like, yeah, I'll come back later, we'll clean it, don't worry about that. Yeah, so some uh, very nice semantic versioning in the name of the notebook. So you work a lot, a work, and two weeks later, you're really proud of what you've done. Now your, your notebooks are all clean. So I don't know if you can read anything, actually, but they're like a little number to say which one you should run first. Uh, you have put out all the hyperparameters in a configuration file. And you have even added the data so that your coworker can reproduce everything in the Git repository. And uh, you, your, uh, also your Python module is like separated in several files, so it's much proper than this 200 line script you used to have. Uh, okay, so uh, let me show you why I think we, we need to set up this, uh, this repo. Uh, first, we need to have a well-structured Python library and uh, its set of tests, functional tests, uh, unit tests, item tests, etc. Uh, then, we need to set up a continuous integration to automate those tests and uh, run them on each feature branch. And the pipeline must be only constituted of uh, Python scripts, we don't want Jupyter notebooks, and uh, we, we can't add the data in the, the Git repository. It's been a long time we know how to handle uh, code projects. Git is perfect for that, so let's do it with, with Git. Thing is, machine learning projects are not like just programming projects. You all have to, to keep track of the data too, because it's an important part of what your model buildings are and you want to have reproducibility, that is to say, know how this model and these results were uh, built and how you did you get got to them. So if you don't keep the data at all, uh, that's gonna be complicated. So this is the story of how we come from a, a pro proof of concept to a production and how we make a data scientist work with software engineer so that they don't kill it one another. So the first contention point was Jupyter Notebooks. Is there anyone in the room who doesn't know what Jupyter Notebooks are? Okay. 
who is using Jupyter Notebooks like roughly every day or every week? Yeah, a lot of people. So I, I, I love, I really love Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, they are great because they are interactive. So as you're programming, you already, uh, at the same time, you get the results in real life. And uh, the code and the results are in the same place. So you can, when you grab a new exploratory analysis, you, it's very easy to, to start and uh, see what's in your data. And they allow for very, very quick iterations, uh, thanks to all of that. Yes, but uh, they are also really terrible. Uh, you can't easily handle uh, a Jupyter notebook merge uh, when there is a, a conflict uh, in your Git branch. They are awful to version. Uh, you can't really test, automatically test uh, the code in your notebook. Uh, they are not production ready. You can ask a system administrator to open a, a notebook and uh, run a few cells uh, in a specific order, I don't know. And uh, there is a huge risk of uh, data leakage because if you, in Jupyter Notebooks, you can version the output and if you put uh, sensitive data and you, if you push them in your Git repository, it can be a, a big risk. So, okay, so I want Jupyter Notebooks, you want scripts, I've got really good solution, we can just copy paste code from Jupyter Notebooks to scripts and vice versa. Okay, maybe you can do something a bit more uh, automatic and try to convert automatically Jupyter Notebook to scripts. There surely are some solutions uh, out there to do that. So here is uh, like a typical clean notebook. Uh, you see that like there's a title, so it's only doing one thing, it's not like the whole uh, analysis. And in the first cell, we put all the variables we might want to change. Uh, like the, the parameters in a uh, programming sense. So there is our input, our output, uh, there is some hyperparameter, which is called the mode here. And uh, there are, uh, also we can just see that there are some cells uh, which are just about uh, understanding and see when, what the data is, is becoming along this notebook and something you don't want to keep if you want to automate that. So to, to convert Jupyter Notebooks to Python script, we tried some uh, existing uh, solution like uh, yeah, NB convert from Jupyter. And uh, you can see uh, here it's an extract of the, the, the generated script. It, it did not fit the, the slide because there is a, a lot of command line, um, etc. But we can add a deeper load. And uh, sorry, here we can see it's not configurable. Uh, variable values are hard coded. And uh, there is still uh, remaining uh, no effect cells, and uh, those statements are, are they really uh, have no interest in a non interactive run, and they can be time consuming, so you don't want to keep them. So, that was the first use case for which we didn't find anything in the current open source solution to suit our needs, and we decided to, to start our own uh, library, uh, so MLV tools. And the, the common name is IPYNB to Python, so uh, it's a mouthful to say, but you don't have to say, you just have to write it down. Uh, and basically, it's just taking a notebook and converting it to a Python script, uh, almost magically. Almost, because you still have, uh, you have to add a doc string in the first cell to describe what are the parameters, and that way you will get a configurable and executable Python script. So here we have the, the previous notebook with uh, the doc string in the first uh, code cell. We can have a deeper look on uh, this doc string. So we can see uh, we declare uh, a data in parameter, which is a, uh, with a, which is a string parameter, and uh, with a short description. And we can do the same for the output pass and uh, the subset mode. Then here is a the script generated with the EPY and B2 Python command. Uh, it's composed of one uh, single uh, function with all parameters mentioned in the doc string. There is no more uh, no effect cells. And in fact, it's a, a Python executable script. Um, can we turn off the slides? We can't see anything, okay. Uh, we, we, we can share the slides. 
Uh, I'm sorry, uh, there is too, too, too much light. Uh, but uh, just uh, trust me, <laughs> you have, a, <laughs> you have a, a command and you can just run a, a dash h on this command and uh, you, you, you will see there is a, all parameters you describe in the, the, the string and you can just provide them and change them without changing, changing the code. So very quickly, uh, we, what does this uh, command enables us to do? We can get configurable and executable scripts from Jupyter Notebooks and remove all the cells that we want to keep for uh, development and for debugging purpose, but we don't want to keep in an automated pipeline uh, setup. Also, since now we have like regular Python script, we can go back to a regular integrated development environment and use the full power of the functionalities. For example, fun usage for a function name or refactor a variable name very easily. And last thing is that since now you've got also regular Python, you've got no more excuses not to write any tests. Uh, so sorry about that, but you'll have to write some tests. <laughs> so everything is fine, we're all very happy. We are like put everything into Python script or of our pipeline. And so now two months later, uh, took quite some time to develop and you've got <laughs> these results you really want to put into production and say, okay, my pipeline is clean now and tested and everything and I just want to reproduce this, those results. And so that's what, on my, that's what is on my hard drive. So I don't know if maybe you've got something similar uh, sometimes and you're like, okay, which was the data I used? Uh, maybe the preprocess final or preprocess final two because it's two, so maybe it's the last one. Or maybe did I want to revert something between the two and the world zero of unknown thing? Or maybe did I integrate all the preprocessing in my pipeline so I just want to use the clean data but not preprocessed? Yeah, so actually, what we really need is in addition to uh, this clean pipeline is data versioning. How, how can we version data? Well, if you have some code, you typically use Git. Everybody knows of Git. It's great. It's collaborative. Just use GitHub or whatever, or GitLab. Uh, everyone has known a bit about it. And uh, it's really great, except when you have huge data files. Uh, they really tend to bloat the repository. Uh, you dug up no GIF on binary files. And once you've put a few terabytes of data, even gigabytes in your repository, uh, you cannot do a git checkout without getting, like, everything is getting really slow. And so your uh, software engineer's coworker, they want to kill you again, so not the best thing, but uh, there are some other things which are called like git large file storage or git annex. As the name says, they're really good for handling uh, larger files and they're integrated with git. Surprise, and they're open source, so that's just perfect. You can have your pipeline in your code, which is probably version now. Uh, your data will be uh, handled with uh, Git large file storage, and your API parameters. Well, if you are in a separate configuration file, you can either add them on Git because it's usually small, or on uh, uh, Git LFS if it's better for you. Until you manage to get something like that. So your raw data, I probably, yeah, maybe you can read a little bit. Yeah, I, I just uh, added the, the link in the stack, uh, uh, principal, principal channel. Uh, yeah, so the raw data was last modified in March, and your preprocessed data was last modified in February. Oops, maybe I actually, like, forget to rerun the preprocessing step, and maybe all the results I've been doing for the past two weeks are actually been working on outdated data. So what we really want to version is uh, like keep uh, both uh, the data and the code in combination and not one separately from the other. Uh, so we, we had a look again on all the open source solution to help us with that and we found something called data version control. Yeah, it's the inventor of DVC. So what, what is DVC? It's a, a versioning tool for machine learning projects. They said it's uh, for data scientists, by data scientists. It's open source, you can find them 
on GitHub. And there is a, a nice uh, video to explain how it works. So, um, about uh, DBC, like I said, it's a versioning tool. It keeps track on, of all your data and all your intermediate results. Everything is stored in a, what, what they call a storage, which can be local or remote, over SSH or cloud, with a cloud-based solution like AWS, Google, uh, Google Cloud, etc. But it's not just a versioning tool. Uh, it, allow you, it allows you to uh, under your experiments, keep a track on all your experiments, I mean uh, data plus code plus hyperparameters, and uh, to reproduce them uh, anytime. And uh, it's also a tool for collaboration. You can share your experiments with uh, your teammates and reproduce uh, them on any um, setup server. To illustrate how it works, uh, we can keep, we can uh, have a look on this example, uh, with, which is a, a pipeline. The first step is a really time-consuming step, which is a data extraction. So you process some documents and you generate some raw data. After that, there is a pre-processing uh, step, which takes as input some hyperparameters and the raw data. It generates some pre-processed data and so on. And uh, in this case, DVC will keep the track of all your inputs data and all uh, intermediate results. And if, for example, sorry, if for example you want to change uh, these hyperparameters and you want to reproduce, re recompute the matrix, you don't need to remember which are the steps to run to reproduce the matrix, which steps are outdated. Um, and what, in which order you need to, to run those steps. You just say to, to DVC that you want to reproduce the evaluation step to generate the matrix, and uh, it will detect which steps are out of date and run them. And uh, with this principle, you want to rerun a time-consuming task when they are not impacted with your change. So, uh, how to create uh, a DVC step? It's pretty simple. You, you need to use the DVC run command and to uh, specify all inputs and all your outputs, then to provide the command. The command must be unexecutable, it can be a Python executable script, a bash command, etc. So, uh, with the, this example, we have a, a step which is an extraction step, which is a Python script. Uh, it takes as input uh, a data archive and it generates a transit uh, CSV file. So the first thing is to uh, repeat uh, the command, then to add the DVC part. But here you can see we need to uh, repeat the input because the input is the input of the script, but it is also a dependency of the step. Then we need to repeat the output. It's really tedious to write, and uh, here we have a simple example on one step, but when you, you need to create all steps of your pipeline, and you have a lot of branches in your pipeline, it can be uh, really complex, really tedious to write, and there is a, uh, a, a big risk of inconsistencies. And you, maybe you want to keep all your, your, your inputs in one place, and just change one value, and uh, the value is replicated everywhere. So to sum up, DVC really is a great tool because it handles for you your dependency graph and there is this great cache mechanism so that you don't have to, uh, you just ask it to reproduce uh, the last step of your pipeline and it will just uh, don't run, rerun ste uh, steps which are not outdated, it just rerun the outdated step. And so it's really good for reproducibility and for collaboration because you can share uh, data, pre-process data at various stage and uh, across data scientists in your company. And so a nice thing is that it's language agnostic. So we are using it with Python, but if part of your pipeline is, I don't know, Bash or Spark or uh, whatever you want to use, uh, you can also use DVC to version that. So that's really great. But on the other hand, um, as Stephanie said, you have to write everything a lot of time, and so if you want to change some path, there's a huge risk that you will mess up somewhere. 
and it's really, really tedious to set up. And so as a data scientist, you don't want to do that every day. You want to have everything taken care of you so that you can focus really on the machine learning part and on the data and not on writing comments. So that's why we developed the second tool in our uh, toolbox, which is called GenDVC. And basically, you take one of our uh, Python scripts with also a doc string to explain a bit uh, what to DVC what to do and it automatically generates uh, a DVC script. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I maybe will be, uh, we'll go quickly on this part because you, you can see anything, and uh, this afternoon we have a workshop on how it works and how to <coughs> set up. But uh, in fact, with a, a script with a single uh, function with some parameters and a uh, and a doc string, we can generate a DVC, the corresponding DVC step. Uh, so we need to add some information in the, in the doc string. So here is uh, the doc string from the, the previous uh, step we, we have generated from the notebook. And now we need to say to DVC which uh, parameter of the script is a, a DVC dependencies or a DVC output or just a, a parameter. So here that I in is a DVC dependency, with, so we flag it with the DVC in tag. Uh, and we can provide the, the path to the file, which is related to the git root directory. Now we can provide the DVC output for this step, and uh, some extra argument, argument for the, the subset mode. And uh, with this script and uh, this doc string, we can use gen DVC command and generate uh, a bash command which contains the DVC run step. So the DVC run which will create a, the DVC step. We, you don't need to know what is in the, inside this script. You <coughs> just need to use it. So to sum up, we basically get the best of both worlds because you can generally, uh, it, sorry, easily generate DVC steps, and then from this step generate pipelines, and all the time ensuring that everything is consistent with one another. Yeah, and uh, if uh, you are in our case and you, you want to keep everything in, uh, in your Jupyter notebook, and uh, you want both uh, Python script and DVC command, you can use uh, epynd to DVC, which is a, a shortcut and uh, it generates from a notebook both Python and DVC command in a one shot. So did we just solve data ops? Well, not quite yet because uh, it's a very young project. It's working very, very well on our pipeline, but we are eager to hear about your problematics and how you are doing things and uh, which, uh, if you have any either pull request or feature request to add to the repository, it's open source already, feel free. But we're already seeing some like really nice improvements uh, in our day-to-day -day life. On the data science point of view, uh, thinking about this as a pipeline, you already allow us to do some modular improvement on some part of the pipeline. And uh, since everything is cached, you can do very fast iterations when you just change an IPAR parameter in your training, you don't have to rerun all of the preprocessing at the same time. So very confident in the result because DVC is taking care for you of the dependency graph. So even if you're running things late on Friday night and you're a bit tired, you know that you will use the correct data. And since all of your data is version, you cannot lose data anymore. Uh, so you can just like when code is version with Git, you can always revert to a previous state. So that's, that's very nice. Yeah, and uh, on the engineering part, you, you get back the full power of your uh, integrated development environment. You can proceed to refactoring. You can know which it used, which, uh, uh, where, where your function are used, even if it's uh, in a notebook. Uh, now you don't have excuse to do not write tests. Uh, you can set up a continuous integration and uh, automatically run all tests, and uh, you are prediction ready. So thank you for your attention. Uh, so the, well, the link to the repository, I guess, is not readable either, but the <laughs> uh, thing is today at 3 p.m. we've got this workshop about uh, applying all that we said. So if you're interested, don't hesitate to drop by. 
and we'll be there today and tomorrow morning if you have any questions. And I don't know if you have time for some questions or if we're already late on schedule. Okay. The, the workshop is uh, written black and white. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if I have time for a question or is the next speaker to Yes? So, so the question was, since you are converting notebook to a script, which goes in the repository? And the answer is both. Uh, we have uh, this uh, git filter to strip out the output to, uh, so to, for this data leakage problem we, we mentioned. So we only have like the input cells which go in the repository and the associated scripts. And we've got some check. I don't know if it's delivered yet or... Yes, we have a... Uh, a script you can uh, set up as a git book to uh, ensure you have a consistency between your your notebook and the generated script. And, uh, after that, it depends on the, the strategy you want to, to adopt. We, we choose to keep both in the, in the and, and so the notebooks are like the reference of what is happening. Uh, but they are not executed as notebooks in production. But uh, since the code is the same, uh, the notebook is always the reference for the pipeline. We don't allow manual changes in the, in the generic cheat script. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you.